Thank you. My name is Rani. I'm a security researcher. I'm really excited to be here at Attack in the Box Singapore. Um, today I will speak about uh, the road to iOS Sandbox Escape. Uh, my main goal is to deliver you guys how iOS is exactly like any other platform, closed source platform, of course, uh, in the aspect of research. And uh, my results with my first research I conducted over iOS. Um, so I actually started with really lack of experience in the iOS field. So what I did was just starting to read a book and go ahead. Um, so what are we going to cover today? We will cover briefly a um, short introduction to iOS, some uh, terms we need to make sure we all know. Uh, iOS containerization, also known as the sandbox. We'll a little bit talk about the shared cache. Uh, we'll speak about LaunchD and Mach messages, which are important for the research I conducted and basically for any research you will probably have on iOS. And we will uh, go and dive into the two approaches ahead for finding Sandbox Escape. We will understand what is Sandbox Escape and whether it's going to be ETA soon from those vulnerabilities, because this is the most important part for some people. Um, and if we will have time, I think we will, there we'll have questions. So where am I? I'm more detailed. Um, security researcher, I'm director of platform research at Zimperium Zilabs team. I best in Tel Aviv right now, uh, in Israel, and I'm an iOS researcher. The difference uh, for me is that this is really a new field for me. I never did anything in, with mobile platforms, so iOS was the first time. Um, so what is iOS? The, the overall terms we need to know, it was evolved from uh, OS 6 and is based upon the Darwin operating system. Uh, in many ways, it is similar to all of the other OS devices, uh, TV OS, Mac OS, Watch OS, but is slightly different in many aspects. It is built upon the XNU kernel, which is basically open source, uh, and it is strictly enforces the notorious sandbox. Uh, that means uh, you can, you, there is the notorious jail, and from the, the jail community, there is the jailbreak process, which basically gives you a read and write. You know, the jailbreak means that you will have uh, full execute and write uh, over the system partition. It is done in many different ways. And this is not the case of my talk today. I will cover only the sandbox escape uh, aspect. So basically on the design of the operating system, and again, this is only a redundant image of the operating system, you can roughly divide it into three parts. You have the application, the core services. I will also uh, call it brokers and the kernel. Um, and let's take YouTube for an example. All of the, all of the application side basically means the untrusted code by the operating system, which is being executed under really restricted sandbox limitations. So whenever YouTube uh, wishes to uh, decode a frame it got of, I don't know, some funny cat video, it will use the video toolbox, oh, have clicker, the video toolbox API, and will ask for Meta Server D to, uh, to communicate with the kernel in order to decode that frame using IOKit communication. So this is roughly the sandbox design because each, each application will be able to communicate with the corresponding daemon only if it needs to. That means that if, uh, for example, Safari doesn't need uh, Bluetooth, which is not true, it will not be able to communicate with Bluetooth and definitely will, will, definitely will not be able to communicate to the kernel extension that handling the Bluetooth communication. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so this is the main uh, design of the operating system. And now, uh, in order to improve uh, some performance, Apple decided to 
combine all of the system libraries and to put them into one file, which is known as DHR cache. Um, basically, it is some kind of similar to uh, kernel 32 DLL, not, not the same, but similar. There are several ways to analyze it. You can use IDA, you can use J2, you can use a lot of different open source, uh, open source, uh, tools you can find online on GitHub. Personally, I used only J2 and IDA, and we will understand in a few slides why it is a huge challenge for iOS researcher. And I think another speaker talked about it just today. Um, so, IPC, the IPC in, uh, in iOS, uh, Apple decided to implement different IPCs on different uh, uh, layers uh, that, is, that are all kind of built upon Mach messages. Uh, all of their Apple, most of Apple IPCs are based upon the Mach messages. This is why it's really important to understand how Mach, mes Mach messaging is working. Uh, Apple also decided to, <coughs> sorry, to implement some of the uh, regular POSIX IPC. Um, so let's dive in into Mac messages. Basically, like I already said, this is the underlying IPC under underneath of most of all the others, like XPC or distributed objects. Um, it is used within the kernel and the user mode, and it's also, of course, used to communicate with the kernel. Mach message trap is the syscall that is being used to send Mach messages, and one of the parameters to Mach message trap, Mach message trap, sorry, is destruct. Destruct basically means um, we will we'll cover some of the fields here. The message bits are used to uh, set the type of the message. Uh, the sender of the message uh, can specify if the message is complex. If the message is complex, there is going to be added the actual data after the header, and the size of the data is going to be defined by the message size. By the message size. Um, there is also the field of the remote port that is used to specify the destination of the message, the port of the message, and the local port, which is Actually, in auxiliary port, you don't have to specify the local port. This is telling to the recipient where to uh, uh, reply the message. And, and there is the message ID, which basically used to convey the, the function ID of the message. That means, uh, again, it's only conventionally used. Um, it is used to tell the recipient which message to invoke. Me, which callback to invoke, sorry. And let's, but we have some kind of a problem because how do I resolve that remote port if I'm an application? How can I know how to communicate with Media Server D, for example? So Apple implemented it using uh, LaunchD. LaunchD is uh, um, essentially you can have a, a whole talk only about LaunchD, but if we want to redundant it, uh, LaunchD is kind of the mother or the father of all the other user user mode uh, daemons or processes. It is used to stop and start daemons, uh, application and processes on demand. Um, you can think of it as the supervisor on the user mode side. And it is also used to uh, resolve those, uh, to resolve daemons. So whenever a daemon, let's for example process A, wishes to register as a new, the new Mach server, it is going to use the function bootstrap check-in and will ask LaunchD to hold the handle to this port and using the name. The name for our example is com.new.demon. Afterwards, uh, LaunchD will hold uh, that the port process A send him that it will be attached to that name. So when process B will want to resolve the, the new Mach, Mach server, it is going to use bootstrap lockup and ask from LaunchD uh, that port. LaunchD will reply with the port that it can, from that moment on, can use in order to communicate directly from process A to process B. So, um, let's dive a little into 
some of the iOS research difficulties ahead. And basically, any other uh, researcher is coming across those uh, difficulties. <coughs> First of all, the device is jailed. That means you cannot really execute your own code uh, with, outside of the sandbox limitations unless, unless you are using some uh, uh, vulnerability that, that is out there. And on every new version, there is one popping out. Um, you cannot really attach debug to demons. What I mean by that is that when you already have a vulnerability, uh, you cannot really debug it in order to easily or comfortably ex exploit that vulnerability. So you need to rely on the crash reports from crashes you have uh, or the device console, which basically means the logs of the, of the device. And moreover, you cannot really uh, flash old versions. That is uh, uh, why you will see an, a lot of iOS researcher, researchers, researchers a desk bunch of different devices uh, that you need to gather around. And by insufficient documentation, I mean that Apple does not really docu document anything that is not for the developer. That means you will not find information that is not relevant to the SDK. Of course, there are some, ex there are a few exceptions, but basically it means that you cannot really know how they implement a lot of stuff within the operating system. And Ida really struggles with the digital cache that we mentioned before and the previ previous slides. So what you have to do is basically get a workstation with a lot of RAM sticks and hope that it will finally be able to analyze this jet cache. So while I was also working on uh, some Ida Python scripts to improve that with Ida, they released Ida 7, which actually got you the ability to load one image with all of its dependencies, and you will not need to uh, load a one gigabyte of code, which basically means uh, it solved, it kind of solved the issue of digital cache, but still, it's not really a good idea to try to extract some functions. It will probably just crash because there are thousands of thousands of functions within digital cache. <clears throat> so, what is a sandbox escape actually? Basically, let's assume we are a malicious application and we want to have, we want to get to the kernel eventually. But right now, within the sandbox, our attack surface is really limited. We can contact only the demons we, we, we can have, we can use, or we can access only few of the kernel, uh, few of the kernel features. Uh, but if we will be able to exploit or get code, arbitrary code execution over one of the demons, we will, we will be able to widen our attack surface. And for MIDI server D, we will be able to find, to, to widen our attack surface and eventually we'll get to the kernel by different vulnerability. Now, it's, I think it's worth to mention that when you're choosing which demon is your target, you should search for the one with the widest attack surface. That means Bluetooth Wi-Fi D will probably, not really, but probably will be able to communicate only with the Wi-Fi drivers, but will not be able to communicate with other Bluetooth, D, Bluetooth drivers, for example. That's why we will see it later that Wi-Fi D is also a client of Bluetooth D. It cannot communicate directly with the Bluetooth drivers, which makes sense because you need one daemon to, to manage the Bluetooth stack. So I started to choose my target. I used SB tool by Jonathan Levine. Um, basically, it inspects the sandbox profile, and obviously, you can run an SB tool only on jailbroken device. Uh, and yet, it helps to get a feeling of the operating system to start and search for your next daemon target. Uh, in our case, I choose not to really arbitrarily choose randomly choose, let's call it, to uh, focus on those two Mach servers. Again, these are the name of the Mach server that demons uh, were registering as new Mach server using Bootstrap Luca. Bootstrap Luca. Uh, the first one is the com Apple Core Media Decompression Session that is uh, being handled by Media Server D. And there is com Apple Server Bluetooth, which is being uh, 
handled by Bluetooth Deep. All you have to do, just take the string, basically, go to the Jared Cache, and find the right string for uh, that Mac server, and find where the media server D registers as a new daemon, as a new Mac server. And this is the, the function that it's using to register as a new daemon, it's figrpc start server which is getting a few different parameters, but the first parameter is the name of the, the, name of the new Mach server. And the third, the third parameter is function that handles each Mach message that is being received. Um, let's dive in into that handler. That handler is pretty simple, uh, pretty simple. It has the in and out message pointed to, uh, to the input Mach message and to the output Mach message. Um, it's going to, <coughs> it is going to use the message ID, decrement some constant number that is being uh, changed by each Mach server, as far as I see, as I, as I found out. It is going to check if that message ID, uh, which again is used to convey which logic is need to be invoked, uh, and it's going to check the message ID that it's below or equal uh, the number of uh, how many callbacks there are. Going to retrieve the address of the callback by uh, using the VTD compression subsystem uh, struct. And eventually it's going to call the handler uh, with the input and the output message. Now, all I had to do is to go that, to that struct and to understand uh, which callbacks I can invoke. So I found out <laughs> that this track holds different, uh, this is only a short list of all the, of all the callbacks. I found they have xcreate, xdestroy, and xdecode frame. Again, each callback is, let's recap a little, each callback is uh, invoked by the message ID from our sandboxed application. That means we can call to each one of those callbacks. So I decided to dive in into the uh, xdecode frame because this is the main logic of the decompression session, as you, as you might guess. And the xdecode frame, after a few research and actually checking the API and seeing what is calling uh, the xdecode frame, I found out that it's the backend of the API called B VT decompression session decode frame. It is decoding frame from a serialized buffer. What that means that Whenever application wishes to decode frame, it is going to serialize the request. We will see how it's serializing in a moment. It is going to send that serialized frame, serialized buffer, serialized sample buffer to uh, media server D. Media server D is going to deserialize it and to starting sending it eventually to the kernel in order to decode the frame. Uh, eventually it's going to return the uh, return a message with the result code back to the client. Um, so what we can see about the logic of the code frame is pretty obvious. It is going to find the, 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 the session, the, the corresponding session uh, by the local port. That means by who sent that message to Meta Server D. This code is run, is being executed on the Meta Server D. And eventually, it's going to call create sample buffer from serialized atom data that is going to deserialize the request. So I stopped for a moment, and again, remember it. This is the first time I'm doing anything on iOS, and I decided to doing something I'm not doing every time, which is to manual analysis the deserialization process, intercept legitimate in order to understand the deserialization intercept legitimate buffers, legitimate serialized buffers, and eventually modifies those buffers. Basically, it calls, it shouldn't be profit, it should be called fuzzing. And I wanted to gain out of it really a lot of, just to get a feeling, what am I, do, what I'm doing here? So let's understand what is actually happening whenever there is the compression session. When application, again, I like to take the example of YouTube, want to deco <coughs> sorry, uh, decode the new frames it got from the internet, it is going to set up a new decompression session. It is going to send a Mach message with the 
information about the new session to MediaServer D. MediaServer D is going to handle that request by the callback X create we just saw. And eventually it is going to call the API call with the decompression session decode frame. And the application is going to serialize the request in order to send it again using Mach message to the callback X decode frame by MediaServer D. So we have a really nice attack surface here because this serialization process is known as uh, sometimes, if you're not, sometimes it's difficult to develop properly. So I had to understand a little bit what is this, this serialization process. And the serialize is actually a really obvious one. It is, it is called create sample buffer from serialized atom data and surface. And it is actually just a TLV, a type length value. Uh, in that case, it was a length type value, but it's the same. Each node is, a, is actually four bytes that are describing the size of the next no, the, of the node, four bytes that are the a type of the node. The first root node is always, always S buff, sample buffer, actually. And then you can have nested nodes that are holding different information of the uh, the, of the frame you want to decode. So I implemented it real quick on, on Python. It's just regular TLV. Uh, the reason I did it was to being able to send raw serialized buffer to meta server D without going through the, through their legitimate API. In this way, I could bypass a lot of the, uh, checking on the, um, on the side of the application. And eventually I wanted to create a sandboxed application that I will be able to file with Server D. So uh, let's see. Whenever the, what I did was taking a legitimate application, asking it to decode frame, intercepting the frames, the serialized frame, already the serialized frames, uh, already the serialized frame, and while working raw on that serialized buffer, I chose to modify those buffers on interesting places. Of course, not on the type of the node, because I want to bypass those checks, but basically on the uh, size of the node or the actual data. And eventually going to replay it back to X decode frame. In this way, I managed to generate, I don't know, 700 megabyte of different unique serialized, serialized uh, corrupted buffers and to see what's going on. So I let it to, to run for, I think, a few hours. And well, the results were just huge. I was being able to create about 3,000 crashes on Media Server D. And after going through those crashes, I found out that there are 31 unique crashes, which is still a lot. Uh, after going through those crashes manually and, and writing some scripts for those, I found out that the vulnerability, the bugs, still not vulnerabilities, are uh, some stress search Apple forgather from probably the bug sessions, some null the reference, and some more interesting bugs, like use after free, out of bounds read, and out of bounds write. Sorry. Um, so while I was traveling to DEF CON and Black Hat, uh, I think it was last year, I was really thrilled about it. I wanted to go back and see what I have in my hands. And what happened next was the most obvious for any iOS researcher, iOS 11. And as long as, as they decided to implement new important stuff like document scanning or iPad multitasking, trying to do it again, uh, they also decided to refactor Media Server D. So I tried it again, my, all of my new uh, uh, corrupted buffers, but no, it didn't work. It stopped working. So I could decide whether I want to do it again. Maybe I missed something. Maybe I'm not using the API call, the API, the API call correctly. But what I had in mind, if this is what I could achieve on my first try, I can do some, I can do it again. Let's do it with Bluetooth D. Bluetooth D, just, to give you some terms, it was rebranded from uh, 
BT server. It is uh, implementing the Bluetooth stack on the user mode. And it actually centralized all the Bluetooth communication on Bluetooth D. And each process with Bluetooth entitlement will communicate uh, using Bluetooth D. That means it will not be able to communicate directly to the kernel. In our terms, this is a trusted broker and a lot of other demons and applications are using Bluetooth D. So it's really interesting uh, way to widen our attack surface. So I did all, all of this, all of uh, what I did in MediaSurfer D, understanding the callbacks, finding out where is the code is exactly being executed. And I found this callback, which is called get pair devices. And again, we have the in and out message. This time it looks much better because I implemented some IDA, IDA, IDA Python script that is taking all the Mach arguments from the from a legitimate application, from a, from the, uh, sorry, from the daemon and reflecting it back to IDA. Therefore, I will be able to have the correct struct sizes and maybe I will be able to automatically uh, fill those fields. So it will look much more beautiful, actually. Um, so let's dive into uh, get per get per devices internal, which is actually the implementation of the callback get per devices. Uh, the fifth argument is data that is absolutely controlled by our input. So I'll give you a moment. Uh, just if you're seeing anything, I'll refresh a little. So if you were quick enough to notice it, there is something unusual here. The fifth argument is controlled by us. Then what Apple tried to do here was to reference the first uh, variable on the stack, documenting from it uh, data that is absolutely controlled by us from our sandbox application. And then they're assigning it to a new pointer uh, on the on new uh, variable on the stack. So. I thought about it a little, and what I had, I had in mind was that Apple just tried to initialize a dynamic array on the stack. But what is the problem with it? Let's see. They are going to take the fifth argument, which is W4. They are going to do some calculation, put it uh, in X9, and they're going to take the stack pointer, put it in X8, but eventually, they're going to put all of this calculation back to the, back to the, spec, to the stack pointer. So it's pretty weird because it's, it's not weird. It's just they are trying to allocate new memory on the stack. But they are, what they failed to do was to check how much memory I'm allocating. So they acknowledge this bug with, call, with the CV4095, which is basically a relative control over the stack pointer which could lead to info leaking inside of the internal uh, inside of the internal functions and it, the, this bug exists in different six different uh, callbacks they had so how they fixed it they decided to fix it by uh, checking how much memory i'm trying to allocate on the stack uh, so it was it th this was the first bug i found in bluetooth d I just saw that I think someone didn't really thought about why they, they are doing it correctly. This is not something you should do in your code, allocating on the stack without checking the, the length of how much you're trying to allocate. So let's understand how that Bluetooth session actually works. Bluetooth D will hold all of the attached clients. Attached clients are uh, Bluetooth BT sessions, Bluetooth sessions. You have daemons, you have the clients can be demons, can be applications. And whenever, um, let's see how I'm lasering, okay. Um, and whenever a daemon wishes to attach to Bluetooth D and start, start to use Bluetooth D capabilities, it is going to uh, call the API called BT session attach. And it's going to hold some information over, of, the, of the session and will ask Bluetooth D to hold that information. As part of the initialization process, sharing D uh, is also going to um, 
send the API call BT local device add callbacks, which was a little bit weird to me. Why does sharing the needs to add callbacks on Bluetooth D side? I mean, something was weird here, but basically what I had in mind was that callbacks is always a really good thing you should start looking for because it's holding addresses. Let's see what, what can I do here? So what I decided to do was to dive in into the Bluetooth uh, uh, BT local device at callbacks process. And I went, I found the callback by the, actually it's the, it's the message ID three. Uh, this is the <clears throat> function that handles the BT local device at callback uh, under Bluetooth D. And the add callbacks internal, which is the actual implementation of the callback, is getting three different parameters. One is the session. The second one is the callback, callback address. And the third one is the data. So let's think about it for a moment. What we saw on MediaServerD, if you remember, they didn't really use any session token. They used, they identified the session to MediaServerD by the local port. But now they're using some kind of session. This data is controlled by by us from our sandbox application. The second one is the callback. Why are they are why they are sending some address to Bluetooth D? That is also weird. So let's see. Basically, what they're doing on Bluetooth D is taking that session token and verifying it uh, against dictionary of all the touch token. And if it can't find the uh, the 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 token, uh, the session, sorry, it is going to return seven, which means error, I could, I could not find the session. Okay, so I thought about it for a moment. Actually, I just tried to play with it a little, but then it came to my mind, what if I am a malicious application and I will repeatedly try to send BT local device set callbacks and to brute force that session token? Again, I don't know what is the size of that, of that field, but let's think about it. Theoretically, if I will be able to, uh, from my sandbox application, to brute force that session token and eventually bypass the check, I will be able to add callbacks to sharing D eventually. And if there is going to be an event, sharing D will just go to address that was controlled by me with the, with the data. So the next slide is actually really funny because all it takes is just doing this, is to make a for loop increment from zero to two bytes and doing some bitwise uh, uh, operation to order it. But, and to try to uh, add new callback with, to that bit with the data 1337. And what it actually was supposed to do is that I found out that the session token was only two bytes. And basically what it means that if this is working, this was a moment before I executed it, if it's working, I will be able to add new callbacks to all of the clients of Bluetooth D. So I just executed it from a sandbox application, of course. And it actually crashed my old device. All of the demons were just crashing and jumping to address that was fully controlled by me. Each one of the demons that are using Bluetooth D, which here is just, I think, a short list. I think there are even more. And I also can register, uh, can control over one of the reg registers for exploit, in order to exploit it. Of course, there, are, there is some work to do, but basically what you, th this is not, this is, this is a really, really good start to exploit those demons. Um, so Apple decided to fix it. Uh, they acknowledged the bug, of course, and they decided to fix it. And their fix is pretty simple. And on first sight, it, it sounds pretty decent one. And they decided to use some uh, global variable, which is sender ID, and this being generated when they are initializing the, when they are initializing the, um, 
the, the Bluetooth session. And that, that uh, token uh, is initialized using arc for random, which is 32 bits for bytes. So they decided to change the token from two bytes to four bytes. To any of you that is familiar, boot forcing two bytes and four bytes, it's, it's the same. So they keep the, they kept the bug. It was allegedly fixed on 11.2.5. And the bug is actually still existing 11.4. So to a question I got a lot on Twitter when there is going to be a jailbreak. So I didn't publish any, but uh, on the late, on the last DEF CON, uh, a guy named Spark from uh, Alibaba, I think, yes, uh, claimed to fully exploit that bug using uh, another primitive he had. And actually, he made a private jailbreak out of it. So, what did we have here? My main goal was to find a sandbox to escape in order to widen as much as possible my attack surface. And what I found is that I could control all of the demons that actually made my attack surface just huge to the kernel. Uh, so basically that is it. Uh, some references I think worth mentioning, JTool uh, and some other uh, tools I used. You can find a fully more detailed QC under my GitHub. Uh, you can find the Spark uh, blog post on this pre presentation on the last two links. Um, I think it was uh, reading. Um, and some credits, of course, to Zimperium for my paycheck. And Jonathan Levine for making a lot of references. A few of my colleagues, Adam Tamir and Nikias. And, of course, to Spark for uh, publishing, semi-publishing the exploit for this vul vulnerability. Um, basically, that is it. Thank you for hearing me out. And Thank questions. you very much, Fanny. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any further questions from the room, perhaps? Yeah. Um, a nice talk. So my question is, when you said that you were communicating with media server D or other demons with using mock messages, did you actually write this mock code in your app or use APIs, which in turn used mock messages internally? Okay, basically, it's not working. Okay, it's working. Um, basically, uh, when you want, mock messaging is a message that you're sending to the kernel, the kernel will deliver it to the application. I mean, to the, to the remote port, to the, to your, to where you want to send that message. So, was it what you were asking or? So you can basically write all the code in mock, like theoretically, right? Sorry? You can write the whole code in just mock messaging, everything. Yes. Because everything internally works using mock messaging. Correct. So my, just, my question was for this expert, did you use APIs which internally call mock messages? No, or you I wrote your own directly mock messages. Okay. That was the idea, you know, because if I'm using, if I'm going, if I was going to use the VTD compression, yes. uh, session decode frame API, I, the decode frame API was going to serialize that message, but I want to send directly those mock messages to the daemon, so I could fuzz it because Got I it. want to fuzz the serialization process. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you very much, Rani. Thank you very much, Rani.